Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Do you think that the church that meets in the hall on the other side of the road could hear us? I mean, we often, when we on our hands and knees saying we're so sorry for our sins, they're praying some praise song to God. Let's see if we can make them hear it. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I think they heard that. <laughs> Dear friends, I think we are all familiar with depictions of people coming and going. In fact, we've even experienced people coming and going, right? Yeah. Um, sometimes it's quite final in terms of funerals. That's a, a going. Um, and it is very joyful as children are born. They're coming. But when we have guests, people come and go. Um, when I was growing up, we had a, a, a sort of a, a it, was, it was almost like the Karting train station at 160 Linwood Road where I grew up. Um, it was just kids, teenagers coming and going, coming and going. I don't think my parents knew who their kids were. I think also that most of you might, in fact I'm pretty sure not might, that you will all remember the 1939 film um, The Wizard of Oz and how Glinda, you'll remember she's the good witch, um, descends upon Dorothy and the Munchkins in a bubble and after delivering a message, oh, incidentally in 1939 that was special effects second to none. And Glinda descends in this bubble, uh, delivers a message and explains the mystery of the ruby slippers. You'll remember, click the heels together, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. You know that the Pope, not the current one because he's not wearing the shoes of the fishermen, but all previous Popes wear red shoes and I always wonder whether while they're celebrating or preaching, they're saying in their minds, clicking the heels together, no place like home, no place like home. <laughs> But the thing about Glinda is that as quickly as she arrives in this bubble, she also leaves in the bubble. Then also, I can't miss a beat, um, Star Trek. No one who has ever watched even a single episode of Star Trek would have missed Captain Kirk or his crew being beamed up from or down to a planet by a transporter beam. Coming, coming, and going. <laughs> Incidentally, dear friends, do you know that Captain Kirk never, ever, ever, in any of the movies, any of the series, ever said, beam me up, Scotty? <laughs> Ask someone who knows about Star Trek. <laughs> Something less known to you might be that... Um, uh, a couple of years ago, the Clokies aren't in church today, but um, a couple of years ago I watched, the, uh, I was suffering seriously from insomnia and I don't think watching Stargate SG-1 was any help. Um, but I borrowed their DVDs, the, all the series, and the later seasons there was a whole, a, a number of programs about ascension and how a person would seek to ascend. And they would become like a, a nebulous bubble of light going up and then coming down and going through walls. And, um, and I think for mo the most part, this is what people think the ascension is. And I think that maybe some of you might be thinking, gee, that's what the ascension is about. Like Mary Poppins arriving on a umbrella. And then when she sorted everything out in the family home, she sort of takes her umbrella, the wind changes, and she flies off. Wrong, dear friends. That is not what the ascension is about. The ascension of Jesus is not a device to get him back into heaven. No. The ascension is an account of how Jesus, having finished his work on earth, 
blazes a trail over which we one day shall also travel. A trail to eternal life that continues our relationship with the risen Jesus and God, who is both our Creator and Redeemer. While other religions have their divine ascension narratives with other worthy ones ascending with that central character, our ascension narrative, Jesus departs alone, leaving his disciples behind, staring into empty space, well not quite empty, but as a cloud takes Jesus out of their sight. I was thinking maybe we should just hang like a, 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 a cottonwood cloud over the, over the altar. And then I thought, no, maybe I should just hire a, a smoke machine because we're not allowed to use incense here. And just sort of disappear the altar in a cloud of smoke. And I think a lot of us would be a little bit perplexed like the disciples. But the thing is, why does it matter that Jesus ascends alone? And his disciples are left behind. Why does that matter? It matters because our work on earth is not yet complete. We learn more about that work from Jesus' prayer for his disciples and us in a rather confusing gospel reading for today. I'll tell you something about Father Steve Verain. He was in... Uh, at Corpus Christi, he was a newly um, ordained deacon, and my folks always sit in the front row, and he read this very passage, and he read it, and he read it, and he read it, and then my stepfather, Ed, looked at him with complete confusion, and Father Steve says, saw it, as he looked up, he saw Ed, and said, are you as confused as I am? <laughs> and he read it again he didn't have Presbyterians after him but I think we get this from what Jesus says in the gospel passage and now I am no longer in the world but they are in the world and I am coming to you dear friends the apostles wanted and needed safety and security and certainty so what did they do? They asked Jesus whether this would not be the appropriate or good time to restore David's kingdom. A moment in the history of Israel when the nation seemed in retrospect to be secure. And Jesus' reply must have increased their anxiety, increased their insecurity, their sense of trepidation, and certainly they were perplexed. The women and men who met with Jesus before his ascension had, to this point, never left the tiny land area that made up the country in which they lived. Now Jesus orders them to go to the ends of the earth and tell the good news that the kingdom of God has broken into the human experience by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Rather than assuring his disciples of a safe haven in political terms, Jesus challenges them to take enormous risks for them. All but one died by execution. Do you know that? All but one. I think, dear friends, we have a terrible time coming to terms with the word evangelism. And I know not more than one priest who, when we say anything about evangelism, they like say, no, that's not us. We have... A, and even more than that, we have trouble with the concept that we should leave the safety and security of this church building to engage others 
with the good news. More likely than not, our outreach portfolio on council might plan meals for the poor. Now, church's presence in the community in community events like the ballet dancers coming in here and the school coming in here. Um, splendid things in themselves, but the very thought that we have a responsibility to speak about Jesus and his kingdom scares us to death. Or perhaps worse, offends our sensibilities. After all, dear friends, religion should not be the subject of polite conversation. True? Maybe. In today's gospel, and remember that it's written in Greek and it's written with um, Greek philosophy influencing the type of language and stuff like that. But in today's gospel, we find Jesus praying to the Father to give his disciples protection once Jesus was out of the picture. Note that Jesus doesn't ask the Father to restore the kingdom of Israel. No, he doesn't do that. Divine protection was to be something other than security. The Spirit was supposed to protect, not only protect, but energize. But what on earth was the Spirit? Some of you who have attended our Pentecost seminars over the last couple of years where I've had to speak about the Holy Spirit, I think, I, I think you'll remember that I say the Spirit to me is enigmatic. When I did my gift assessment, my stuff falls on the creative side rather than on the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. It's just my gifting. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person or not gifted. Dear friends, the disciples, as devout Jews, knew who God was. And they knew Jesus. Perhaps they remembered that in the Genesis account of creation, the Spirit broods on the face of the deep and cooperates in the creation event. The church would come to believe that Jesus was present in creation. After all, we say in the Nicene Creed, through him all things were made. But as yet, these frightened followers of Jesus knew nothing of the power of the Spirit as the Spirit cooperates with Jesus in a new creation. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God on earth of which each one of us sitting here today are now citizens through our baptism. Pentecost would change all that. But as yet, in our stories, we aren't there yet. Instead, we share the disciples' insecurity and huddle in our little kingdoms we call churches. We hope and pray that others will join us. Of course, people who like the way we do things, maybe even think the same way we do. Uh, we do. Maybe people who will help keep our parish budget liquid. Incidentally, we need that. Or more daring, help financially with the project of building new classrooms for our Sunday school. We hope they will access our Facebook group or page, take a look at our virtual church, or be attracted by the sign outside, which incidentally needs a little bit of attention, that tells them that Trinity Church welcomes them in three languages. Nothing yet propels us out beyond the palisade fencing into the marketplace to tell the good news that Jesus transforms and makes all things new. Will this year's Pentecost, only a week away, make any difference? 
Or will we still ask God to restore the kingdom when the churches were full and wealthy people gave abundantly and sacrificially to the life and work of the church? Dear friends, we must pray that our parish will be renewed by God, the Holy Spirit, who always shows, shows us Jesus and through him brings us to the Father. But there's one further step. We must pray that each of us in our own way will hear Jesus calling us to go out beyond our own comfort zones to tell out the glory of the Lord. The disciples feared being killed. As I said, all but one were executed. Our fear is probably just as debilitating, but not as serious. We fear ridicule. We fear that people won't take us seriously. So perhaps our prayer should be that God will remove from us our fear of appearing inadequate and replace that fear with the spirit of courage to live out our baptismal promises, which incidentally, if you'll remember, we renewed on Easter morning. We are called. Jesus instructs us, as he instructed his disciples, go into Jerusalem, Judea, Sumeria, the uttermost parts of the world, as today's, as we, this is from the reading of Acts. Or shall we sit in our upper room and wait for the kingdom? Dear friends, Jesus does not come and go on a transporter beam or in a bubble of light or on an umbrella. His presence abides in the church and in a personal and unique relationship with each of us. That is what we celebrate in the great 50 days of Easter. But, dear friends, we are called to go and make disciples of all nations. Now I want you to listen very carefully because I'm changing the words slightly. Alleluia, Christ has ascended. He has ascended indeed. Alleluia. Amen.